It is now time for a question period. Her Majesty's, uh, the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Criminal charges have now been laid against one of the Premier's most senior operatives, Jerry Lawhe Jr. The OPP investigations against the apparent contraventions of the Elections Act by the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff and Jerry Lawhe remain open and ongoing. Mr. Speaker, now that charges have been laid, will the Premier set the record straight? Did the Premier instruct either Pat Sabera or Jerry Lawhe Jr. to offer Andrew Olivier a job or an appointment in exchange for staying out of the Sudbury by-election? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as the leader of the opposition knows, we're aware of the charges that have been laid against Mr. Lougheed. The police have informed um, Pat Cervera's counsel that uh, she will not face any criminal charges. That is also uh, public knowledge now, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I've been open with the legislature. I've been open with the media, Mr. Speaker, and I've been open with the public about uh, about these allegations. And uh, we have faith in the process. We have cooperated. I am going to seek order immediately. The member from Renfrew, come to order. Please. We have cooperated fully with the process, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to do so. And uh, this matter is now before the courts, and I will not be commenting on uh, on the situation in such Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. Just because Pat Sabera won't face criminal charges, it doesn't mean she won't be charged under the Elections Act. In a media interview in mid-December, Jerry Lougheed Jr. confirmed that he spoke with the Premier before he spoke with Andrew Olivier. On the tapes, Mr. Lougheed says, I come to you on behalf of the Premier. On the tapes, Pat Sabera says, you've been directly asked by the Leader and the Premier to make a decision to step aside to allow Glenn to have this opportunity uncontested. In the eyes of the hard-working people in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, Pat Sabera's actions are no different than Jerry Lougheed's. In fact, they may be worse. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier tell the people of Ontario what she instructed Lougheed and Sabera to say and to offer to Andrew Olivier? <laughs> Thank you. Premier. Speaker, and again, I will just remind the uh, the leader of the, op of the opposition that there are no criminal charges that are going to be laid uh, against Pat Cervera. That is public knowledge, Mr. Speaker. As far as I know, in terms of the Elections Ontario investigation, it is ongoing, Mr. Speaker. I, we have no uh, knowledge to the uh, the converse of that, and we'll continue to cooperate with that independent investigation, Mr. Speaker. But in terms of the uh, the other questions about uh, the Sudbury by-election, uh, those matters are before. The court, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, the Premier is going to have to tell the truth at some point. There is a possibility that this Premier. I, uh, I'm going to ask, them, I'm going to ask the, the Leader to withdraw and to be very cautious of how we're going to uh, say things that we can't say directly, we're not going to say indirectly. Withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, to the Premier, the Premier is going to have to Mr. Agriculture. at some point. Yep. There is a possibility this Premier will be subpoenaed to testify. There is a possibility the Deputy Chief of Staff will be subpoenaed to testify. The Premier's office must be held to the highest standard. How can the Premier, in good conscience, continue to evade answering these questions when there are serious criminal allegations of corruption that go to the heart of the highest levels of her office? <laughs> Please. 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 Thank you, Premier. I have uh, I have answered questions in this house. I have answered questions in the legislature, in the uh, with the media, Mr. Speaker. I have been very clear uh, in terms of uh, my involvement in what happened, Mr. Speaker. And um, there there are no criminal charges that are being laid against uh, my staff person, Pat Cerbera. There is an ongoing investigation in terms of the uh, elections, Ontario, Mr. Speaker. But I would say to the leader of the opposition that. At every juncture, I have cooperated. I have worked with the investigation, Mr. Speaker. I will continue to do so. I have answered those questions, Mr. Speaker. Now there are issues that are before a criminal court, before a court, Mr. Speaker, and I won't comment. Member from Leeds, Grenville, on the order. Question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. 
When the Liberal government couldn't negotiate a contract with the doctors, they slashed their fees paid to physicians in retaliation. The Liberals have cut $580 million from physician services as a punishment for not agreeing to the government's deal. What does this government not understand? This is a cut to patients. They aren't just punishing doctors. The government is punishing patients President in Ontario. Of the, Treasury Board. The, the people of Ontario are going to be hurt. The people that are going to be hurt are stroke patients, young families, the elderly, all those in need of Ontario's medical help and care. Mr. Speaker, why is the Premier being so short-sighted? Why does she continue to slash health care funding for frontline health care workers? Well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition is talking about a negotiation. We have a deep respect and admiration for the doctors of this province, Mr. Speaker. We know how critical they are. You know, I grew up in the family of a general practitioner, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. My dad is, is, uh, has worked. He's not working now. He's going to be 90 years old next year. But, Mr. Speaker, he practiced in this province, and I know how critical primary care physicians are. It's why, Mr. Speaker, we've hired thousands more doctors, from thousands Prince Edward more Hastings. doctors in this province than there were when we came into office in 2003, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the Ontario Medical Association rejected the offer that was on the table. A third party, Justice Winkler, came in, Mr. Speaker, looked at the offer, recommended that the OMA accept the, or the offer, Mr. Speaker. Answer. They chose not to, so we had to go forward and uh, implement the offer, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, rather than blaming hardworking doctors, let's talk about the facts. The $580 million cut to health care is threatening access to quality and patient-focused care. With 800,000 Ontarians already without a doctor and 140,000 new patients each year in Ontario, these cuts will make it even harder for people to get care they need. Cuts that will lead to the closure of many walk-in clinics. Clinics that are visited each day by the very people that don't have a family doctor. That means those patients will have no choice but to go to eMERGE. And that means longer wait times at eMERGE. Mr. Speaker, the damage from these cuts is being felt in Minister of Finance. large and small. Will the Premier get her priorities straight and stop this assault on frontline health care in Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Premier. I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is just raring to, uh, to answer the, the supplementary, Mr. Speaker, but let me, just, let me just be clear. Despite the fact that this, uh, this member was in the federal government at the time when Stephen Harper slashed the Canada oh, Health Transfer oh, from Nepean and Carlton will come to order. And the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Finish, please. I the fact, Mr. Speaker, that that cut will mean $8 billion less to Ontario over 10 years. We have consistently increased health care funding, Mr. Speaker. Doctors salaries, doctors, compensation in Ontario has gone up 60 per cent under our watch, Mr. Speaker. The average doctor in Ontario uh, bills about $350,000, Mr. Speaker. They're among the best paid in the country. Mr. Speaker, according to the Premier's own budget, the federal government, the federal government transferred— The member from Trinity Spadina, come to order. Mr. Carry Speaker, on. according to the Premier's own budget, the federal transfers increased by $652 million, but you only spent $598 million, so you cut $54 million from the health care budget in Ontario. Shame. Shame. So, 
years, years of cutting funding to doctors. Two years ago, it was $850 Minister of Natural million. Resources, come to Then order. it was $580 million cut earlier this year, and now another $235 million cut. This has real results in, in Ontario's health care delivery. This means the closure of at least six addiction centres just in Toronto alone. It means longer wait times at ER, family doctor offices and question. clinics. It means 140,000 people struggling to find a family doctor. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is maybe instead of $5 million in bonuses to Pan Am execs, $24 million in salaries and benefits for high execs. Thank you. Thank you. Premier. It's a long term care. Yeah. Yeah, you want to get it. Like that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the member opposite, the leader of the official opposition, wasn't here under the Mike Harris government when that government slashed health care, closed hospitals, fired thousands of nurses across this province. And it's true, Mr. Speaker. It's true. When we came into government in 2003, we inherited a system that was disrespectful of our doctors. Doctors were leaving the province. Doctors weren't adequately compensated. We've corrected that. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Minister, please. We appreciate the work that our doctors do across this province. We increased their compensation from government by 61 per cent over the last decade, to the point where they are among the best paid in Canada, if not in North America, as they should be, Mr. Speaker, and that's going to continue. Answer. Our budget, as well as increasing by 1.25 per cent each year, it'll continue to increase to represent Thank our you. doctors well. No question. The leader of the third party. My question is for the Premier. Last January, at the beginning of her efforts to hide her role in the role of her office in the Sudbury bribery scandal, the Premier issued a statement saying that Mr. Lougheed, quote, is not government or Liberal Party staff. He speaks for himself, unquote. But Mr. Lougheed certainly seemed to think that he was speaking for the Premier Speaker, and it's a bit rich for the Premier to distance herself from a well-known senior Liberal bagman who has raised a lot of money for her campaigns and has raised a lot of money for Mr. Trudeau's campaign. Does the Premier still stand by her statement that Mr. Lougheed wasn't speaking for her or anyone in her office? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I will uh, I'll repeat what I said earlier, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we're aware of the charges uh, that have been laid against Mr. Lougheed. Um, there are no criminal charges that have been laid against my staff person, uh, Pat Sorbera, Mr. Speaker. There is now a case before the courts, and I'm not going to comment further on that. But the leader of the third party knows that I have answered questions in the legislature. I have asked questions, uh, answered questions of the media. I've been very clear about uh, the, um, the, uh, in, in the incidents around the, uh, the Sudbury by-election, Mr. Speaker, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to litigate a case that is now in front of the courts. Mr. Thank you. Premier has refused to take any responsibility in the Sudbury bribery scandal. But while the Premier is trying to act like she barely even knew Jerry Lougheed, the transcripts, transcripts say in black and white that Mr. Lougheed was, quote, acting on behalf of the Premier. My question to the Premier is this. Did the Premier order the call, and was Mr. Lougheed, in fact, speaking on behalf of the Premier as he claimed? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, these are issues that are going to be dealt with in a court, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to comment any further on them. Well, Final supplementary. Responsibility for this mess, but something simply is not adding up. If the Premier has nothing to hide, she should just say so, Speaker. Mr. Lougheed, the transcripts say very clearly, and I quote, they would like to present you options in terms of appointments, jobs, whatever. On the recording, it certainly seems that the they are the Premier and Ms. Sorbera. Who ordered the call? Was it the Premier, was it Ms. Sorbera, or was it someone else in the Premier's office? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I think maybe the leader of the third party should uh, look to her deputy leader, who's also a lawyer, and may maybe get some legal advice. Wow. And that advice should be on the lines of, Speaker, that uh, she should not be soliciting uh, anybody in this house to interfere in a judicial proceeding. Uh, I think that's, uh, Speaker, a well-known fact. Uh, you don't need to have a law degree to understand that we do not interfere in any kind of investigations or judicial uh, proceedings. 
it will be highly inappropriate, Speaker. So all these questions that, uh, that uh, the member opposite is asking are inappropriate, and I, I would suggest to her respectfully uh, that she should not be soliciting anybody in this House uh, to interfere in the ju 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 judicial uh, proceeding. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. No question. The Leader of the Third Party. Questions also to the Premier. This is a Premier who loves to talk about having conversations, Speaker, and it's clear from the transcripts of the recorded telephone calls that the Premier, Ms. Sorbera, the member for Sudbury, and Mr. Lougheed were all having lots of conversations behind the scenes, Speaker. There's a good reason to believe that every Every single one of these four people know who it was that ordered Mr. Lougheed to make the call. Will this Premier show some leadership, Speaker, and allow the people in her office and in her caucus to come forward with what they know about the order to uh, have Mr. Olivier accept a bribe? There is a process that has unfolded and is unfolding outside of this legislature. I have cooperated with that process, Mr. Speaker. I will continue to do so. But the fact is that this is not the court. This is not the court where the decisions are going to be made. We are not having that. That process is not in this room, Mr. Speaker. It is happening outside of the legislature. We will continue to cooperate, Mr. Speaker, and as we have done all along. As we have done. Thank you. Supplementary. The province of Ontario shouldn't have to be sworn in by a judge to be upfront with the people of Ontario. She has been tying herself in knots to protect herself and Liberal insiders while she keeps the truth from Ontarians. The Premier, Ms. Sorbera, the member for Sudbury and Mr. Lougheed are all in this up to their next speaker. Does this Premier actually expect Ontarians to believe that no one in her office or her caucus knew about the calls to offer Mr. Olivier a bribe to step aside? Speaker, once again, uh, there is a reason why we keep our uh, judicial system separate from our political system. And the reason exactly for this reason that we do not try cases in, in the legislature. What the leader of the third party is, is doing is, is, is trying to inject politics in the matter for the court speaker. And I think, I think the prudent advice to her would be that she should refrain from doing so. She is not a judge. She is not the trier of fact. She is not a litigator, as far as I know, in this case either. All those steps, Speaker, will take place in front of a judge. It's not a matter, it's not a matter of getting sworn before a judge or not. That is how the system works, brownie. Speaker, and it works for, for, uh, for reasons like this for centuries, and it is the right system. Let's not mix politics with the, with the judicial proceeding. Let's resp respect the process. The Premier has cooperated on this matter from day one. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, it seems like no matter how badly you behave, if you're a Liberal, you have to be dragged away in cuffs before you're held accountable in this province. This Premier needs to act step up and show some responsibility speaker some someone is not coming clean no one believes that the premier that her deputy chief of staff and that the member of Sudbury absolutely knew nothing if the premier and her staff had nothing to do with this speaker she should simply say so she's the one that promised over and over again that she was going to do things differently exactly. this time around for the liberal speaker seems like the same old same old is happening in this chamber why won't the premier be upfront and honest with ontarians and tell this house who ordered that call speaker the the Premier has been honest. The Premier has been honest and upfront with the people of Ontario. She is, remains. She has been open on this matter. She has. She has cooperated. Speaker, the Premier has cooperated on this matter from day one, but we are not going to break rules by interfering in a judicial proceeding, and I think the leader of the third party should also refrain from doing so. Uh, speaker, so we are not going to comment any further uh, on this matter, and Premier and this government will remain focused on the mandate that the people of Ontario has given to us. We will continue to focus on building Ontario up. We are going to continue to focus on investing in the skills and talents of Ontarians. Yes, we are going to continue to focus on building infrastructure infrastructure which is much needed across this province. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 
Speaker, last week the Auditor General released a scathing report detailing the CCAC's failing of our most vulnerable citizens. And Mr. Speaker, the CCAC's failing the people of Ontario means this Liberal government has failed the people of Ontario. The Liberals failed when they allowed 40 percent of funding to go directly to bureaucracy, which is quite unheard of. Mr. Speaker, every member in this House must have heard a horror story of a patient being denied the CCAC service they deserve. Mr. Speaker, why did the minister ignore the cries of those patients in need, and where was the accountability in this government to ensure cost-effective care? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. I think the member knows that I uh, spoke to the Auditor General's report last year. I endorsed her report. I accepted it. Sorry, last last week I accepted her report. I accepted uh, all of her recommendations, and I indicated that I plan, as the minister, uh, to implement all of her recommendations in her report, Mr. Speaker. But I also mentioned that since earlier this year we've been very engaged. In fact, the government had asked uh, some time ago for Gail Donner and expert panel to look at home care for us. She presented her report in January of this year, and since then we've implemented uh, we've accepted and implemented all of her recommendations as well, and we have a 10-point action plan that reflects her recommendations. We're going to be working with both reports, implementing both reports in their entirety, Mr. Speaker. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, back to the minister. Minister, far too long this uh, win Liberal government has ignored all those people who were turned away or moved down the wait list at the CCACs. For five years, this ministry failed to conduct, conduct an analysis to show whether service providers could deliver better direct programs. This Liberal government allowed costs to skyrocket without considering the damage to our health care system. Mr. Speaker, it's time for action, not studies or high-priced consultants. It's time for accountability. Minister, the Auditor General's report clearly shows you're incapable of controlling the bureaucracy in the health care system. Are you not up to the job? Here, here. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, the uh, member opposite knows because he's in, he has a background in the health sector, and I appreciate that and enjoy the fact that he uh, uh, will be an effective uh, critic uh, for that and I'm sure other reasons. But I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that we have world-class health providers that are working in our CCACs and with the contracted agencies providing support uh, to people, roughly 800,000 Ontarians around the year. But I want to point out that the party opposite did vote against our $250 million increase annually for our CCACs for home and community care going forward in the next three years. We're investing $2.5 billion in our CCACs. We're implementing. We're not having another study. We're not doing another review. We have two good roadmaps that we're following with recommendations from the Auditor General, with recommendations from Gail Donner and her expert panel. We're, at, we're yes, implementing her recommendations to make sure that we're providing the best possible care. Thank you. Your question? A member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, a question to the Premier. The Premier says she has an election mandate from the people to sell off Ontario's oldest and most important public asset. But Ontarians aren't buying it. They don't like being duped. At least 165 Ontario municipalities have passed resolutions since the election opposing the Premier's sale of Hydro One. And over the weekend, a national columnist wrote, and I quote, her decision to privatize Hydro One is a reminder of how flexible, some might say duplicitous, liberals can be once they gain power, unquote. Will the Premier stop her duplicity, listen to Ontarians, and reverse her reckless, short-sighted plan Question. to sell Hydro One? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question from uh, the critic from the third party, Mr. Speaker. They have been crisscrossing the province, meeting with people, Mr. Speaker, and flaming them on so-called uh, skyrocketing hydro prices because of broadening ownership. Mr. Speaker, just last week, the Supreme Court of Canada, not a journalist in any newspaper, the Supreme Court of Canada has upheld the right of the Ontario Energy Board to ensure consumers pay just and reasonable rates for electricity or any other utility, Mr. Speaker, on expenditures like collective bargaining labour agreements. In a decision Friday, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled on the long-standing dispute that began after the Energy Board determined Ontario power generations Labor costs were too high and disallowed the full payment amount requested. Mr. Speaker, the Supreme Court of Canada says the OEB's mandate is to review yes, the sir. underlying cost structure and make sure the costs that OPG seeks to pass off to customers 
Two rates are just Thank and you. reasonable. This applies. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Premier. These 165 municipalities need money for infrastructure. They also know that Hydro One makes money for Ontario. The Hydro One prospectus tells investors to expect cash dividends of $500 million per year. They know that a privatized Hydro One will drive up electricity rates and make it harder to deliver essential municipal services. They know this is a bad deal. Will the Premier stop ignoring these 165 municipalities and keep Hydro One public? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member wants to ignore a ruling from the Supreme Court of Canada, Mr. Speaker, which says that the OEB does have the power and is in fact reducing rates when they're required to be reduced, Mr. Speaker. Not only with electricity companies, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board uh, just last week again, Mr. Speaker, a lot of fast moving news here. The OEB approved decreases in natural gas rates for Enbridge and Union Gas customers, Mr. Speaker. The OEB, Mr. Speaker, is functioning, it's responsible, it's one of the best regulatory agency in North America, Mr. Speaker, and they will control and modify and hold Hydro One to account on rates, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question the member from Brampton West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. As a member for Brampton West, I know that transit is extremely important to those living in my community. Many of my constituents rely on Go Transit to get to and from work every day. And they tell me that they want to see our government making investments in transit and transportation that truly count. Mr. Speaker, as part of, the budget, 2015, uh, as part of budget 2015, our government announced improvements to the Go Rail Network as part of our regional express rail plan. Can the minister please tell members of this house what kind of service improvements interiors can expect under this plan? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member from Brampton West, not only for his advocacy and the question today, but for continuing to be a great champion for all of Brampton. As announced, Speaker, as announced, Speaker in Budget 2015, as the member mentioned, our government is making the single largest infrastructure investment in this province's history. We are investing $13.5 billion to improve the entire GO Transit network as part of our regional express rail plan. As part of that plan, Speaker, we will be giving those living in the GTHA new travel options with faster and more frequent service and electrification on core segments of the GO Rail network. And specifically, Speaker, that means that these investments will more than double peak service and quadruple off-peak service compared to today. Reduce journey times for some cross-region transit trips by as much as 50 percent, Speaker, and a much wider range of travel options for those living in and around the GTHA. Progress is yes, already being made, but our government will continue to work with Metrolinx to deliver on this important plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his response. As the minister noted, our government is making the single largest in infrastructure investment in Ontario's history, and I know that those living in my community will be pleased to hear that they will be seeing service improvements as part of our regional express rail plan. But I also know that those living in my community do not want to wait 10 years to see these improvements. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell members of this House if those living in Brampton can expect to see increased service sooner than 10 years from now? Thanks. thanks very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member again for the follow-up question. Of course, Speaker, we expect that over the next 10 years, weekly trips across the entire Go Rail network will grow from the current 1,500 to nearly 6,000. But, Speaker, importantly, we're not waiting 10 years to deliver important results. Earlier this month, Speaker, I was happy to announce that we have already added 14 new train trips on the Kitchener line between Mount Pleasant Go Station and Union Station, Speaker. This is an investment that will directly help those living in the community of Brampton along this particular line. It's further proof, Speaker, that our government's commitment to making daily commutes and quality of life better for Ontarians is happening, whether they live in York Region, frankly, Speaker, whether they live in Thunder Bay, where we build most of our transit vehicles, or they live in Brampton, Speaker. Credit to this premier for getting the job done. Thank you. Any questions? 
member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the true price of the many Liberal scandals is hitting home in Northern Ontario. Yep. To pay for their gas plant scandal or their smart meter scandal, this government is firing nurses. Hundreds of nurses have been fired in Sudbury, Timmins, the Sioux, and my hometown of North Bay. A recent Sudbury Star headline reads, quote, Nurse layoffs jeopardize lives. Or the North Bay uh, Nugget headline, Speaker, deaths will rise if nursing cuts not opposed. The Liberal government just fired 158 health care workers at the North Bay Hospital. And, Speaker, that's on top of the 197 they fired over the last three Question. years. Speaker, when will this government come clean and admit they are firing nurses to pay for their scandals? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I've had the opportunity to speak with the member opposite specifically about uh, his hospital in North Bay, uh, and he does know because we talked about this that the funding uh, in that hospital has increased by over 100 million since we came into office. Uh, he also knows, and I, I took some time to uh, to detail this with him because I believe it's important, uh, is that the Lynn and the hospital are still having discussions. There has been no decision, uh, Mr. Speaker. There isn't an official plan going forward. Uh, by the hospital that's being approved by the Lynn. The Lynn and the hospital are in those negotiations and working first and foremost, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that there'll be no negative impact on patient care. I'm confident that if we give that time and space to the Lynn and the hospital to have those negotiations, to build that plan together, the, the ministry has been working as well diligently with both parties to make yes, sure sir. that we're prepared to step in where we, where we need to to make sure that quality of care is maintained. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Speaker, the Auditor General told us that the consequences of Liberal spending would, quote, crowd out the programs Ontarians depend on, add the cost of their scandals, and we now see what this government is doing. Deputy House Leader. Waste a billion dollars on the Orange scandal, fire 100 nurses in Timmins and the Sioux. Waste a billion dollars on the gas plant scandal, fire 100 nurses in Sudbury. Waste a couple billion dollars on smart meters, fire a couple hundred nurses in North Bay. Get caught paying $10,000 to have computer files deleted? Don't worry, just fire another nurse up north. Speaker, how many more nurses and frontline health care workers is this government going to fire to pay for their next scandal? Please. Please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Well, the member opposite, of course, has his own list. Here's mine. That opposition party in the last election promised to fire 100,000 workers in the broader public sector, many of them health care workers, Mr. Speaker. That party opposite, when they were in government, fired thousands of nurses, thousands of nurses, closed dozens of hospitals, Mr. Speaker. We've hired, since we came into office, to correct their mistakes and the damage that they had done. have hired more than 24,000 nurses. More than 10,000 of those are registered nurses. And, of course, Sudbury, out, out of the, the very first location in this province, Mr. Speaker, to have a nurse practitioner-led clinic, the first of 25 that exist in this province today. That's our commitment. It's not the commitment of your, par of your party. In fact, we've corrected in the last decade the errors that you As you have been reminded, this is the, the chair that you speak to and uh, not through. This is the chair that you speak to when asking questions and delivering answers. Uh, new question, the member for Timmins, James Bay. <coughs> My question uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, is to the Premier. Your Liberal operative, Mr. Jerry, uh, Mr. Lawhey, who uh, has done a lot of work for both yourself and Mr. has said that he'd been trying for years to get Mr. Tebow to run in the Ontario Legislature. In the end, there was just one problem, and that was there was a Mr. Olivier who wanted to run in that nomination. Surely this hurdle must have come up in your discussion with Mr. Tebow. Our question simply is this. Can you confirm that you actually talked about the problems in regards to the nomination with Mr. Tebow before he ran? 
Again, uh, again, Speaker, I, I'm not sure the member uh, member uh, heard my response earlier, and I will restate that uh, I think the the opposition should not be soliciting the government to interfere in a judicial proceeding. It will be highly inappropriate. Speaker, uh, our system ensures that there is clear uh, delineation between the political side, the legislative branch, and the executive branch, uh, and that from uh, the the, uh, the judicial, uh, the court system, Speaker. And I think it will be. I think the member will agree with me uh, that it will be very uh, inappropriate for any member of this house to interfere this man, uh, matter or speak to it. We'll let the ju judicial proceeding to continue and uh, have the facts come out uh, and deliberations made at that stage. Thank you. Thank you. To the chair, please. Supplementary. Through you, Speaker, back to the Premier. No, I don't agree with that. The facts are Mr. Thibault had discussions with a number of Liberal operatives, including the Premier, in regards to running in the Sudbury by-election. Our question is a very simple one. Did the Premier or anyone else have discussions with Mr. Thibault vis-a-vis -vis the problems they were going to have when it came to the nomination process, yes or no? Thank you. Sir, and speaker, with all due respect to the member opposite, he should know that in our system, facts are not litigated in the chamber of the House. There's a reason, Speaker, a judge is referred to as the trier of fact. It's the judge's job to be able to determine the fact. Finish, please. I think, Speaker, the member officer should listen to their, his deputy leader. He's pleading them, he's begging them not to ask these questions. I think they're jeopardizing his law license as a result, Speaker, by not heeding to his advice on this matter. This is a judicial proceeding. We should not be interfering, and we'll, we will not be commenting Answer. any further on it. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for seniors' affairs. Uh, minister, the oldest members of the baby boom generation in North America turned 65 in 2011. By the year 2036, our province's older adult population were more than double to 4.1 million seniors. This major change is going to affect every jurisdiction in Canada, and it's presenting both challenges and opportunities for every community here in Ontario. Minister, you recently launched the Age-Friendly Community Planning Grant that's going to help build more accessible and inclusive communities across the province. This funding is very important, and it's been well received by municipalities and organizations across the province, including in my riding of Kitchener Centre, where the City of Kitchener received $50,000. Speaker, can the minister please inform this House Question. how this new grant is going to help improve the lives of seniors in Ontario? Minister responsible for seniors affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the uh, member from the Kitchener Centre. Speaker, our new $1.5 million age-friendly community planning grant program is yet another example of our government's commitment to seniors in this province. This funding is providing grants to municipalities and organizations to undertake essential strategic planning in their communities with a strong focus on seniors. It is assisting community to decide what local improvement they can make to enable people of all ages to fully participate in life, such as installing automatic doors, adding benches in parks and roadways, increasing accessibility of retail centers and transportation, and installing countdown timers at crosswalk. Speaker, working together with the municipality to invest in age-friendly communities, it's a part of our government economic commitment Answer. to build on the area up and it's also to build a better Ontario for our senior speakers. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's very encouraging to see the steps that we are taking to actively support municipalities across Ontario as they plan to accommodate seniors to contribute and stay active in all aspects of life. Now, in my community, as mentioned, the municipality is receiving $50,000 for a project that's going to conduct a needs assessment and develop an action plan to address any identified needs and gaps for seniors in Kitchener. And this project is also directed at ensuring that my community 
Security is not only friendly for older adults, but also persons with all abilities and ages. We want Kitchener to continue being vibrant and healthy as possible. And uh, I've already received lots of positive feedback from the city and from local seniors groups that are expressing interest and gratitude for this funding. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate Question. on other initiatives that we have undertaken to develop more age-friendly communities across Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Um, speaker, again, thanks to the member. Our collective challenge is to ensure our communities grow to meet the evolving needs of every person, regardless of their age or ability. Speaker. This is why the age-friendly community planning is so important, and it is why we will continue to work with municipalities, seniors organizations, and community partners as well. Speaker, Ontario is investing an additional $200,000 in an outreach initiative program to provide free assistance across the province to communities that are interested in adopting an age-friendly planning principle. Uh, we have developed an invaluable planning guide, Speaker, to provide essential information to municipalities on development, implementation, and evaluation of plans for age-friendly communities. As well, we have been partnering with the University of Waterloo, Answer. the Ontario Interdisciplinary Council of Aging and Health, and Seniors uh, Health Knowledge Network to lead this particular outreach speaker. We will continue to find new ways to Thank serve you. our senior speakers. Good question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier this morning. Premier, one of the most frequent issues that comes up in my constituency office in Belleville is home care or the lack of it. Patients and their families are often on the receiving end of much less care than what the CCAC has originally promised them. Last week, we learned from the Auditor General why, and the minister is probably going to pop up here like a whack-a-mole and tell us that he's spending millions of dollars more on home care, but what the Auditor General told us yesterday or last week is that more and more money is being sunk into administration and sunshine list salaries, and less and less is going into actual health care on the front lines. So, Premier, can you explain why only 47 per cent of people who need to see a nurse in the first 24 hours after leaving hospital are actually seeing one of the home care workers, and why administrative salaries have gone up by 27 per cent? Good question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. And it is unacceptable, that figure that he uh, just described about the rapid response nurses that it's so important when uh, individuals do transition out of hospital that they can expect to receive that care uh, when they arrive home to support them. So we will be working with our, LIN our LINs and our CCACs to make sure that we can improve that, to set targets. Which, uh, and to measure the, uh, the success, so we actually see that improvement in that area. I have said last week as well with the Auditor General uh, that we accept all of her recommendations. Uh, they are important, equally important. She also has an important recommendation, number five, which says essentially that we should review the entire model of delivery of home care uh, to Ontario citizens. We plan on uh, not having another review, Mr. Speaker. We have been spending a long time looking at this. We have Gail Donner's report from earlier this year to benefit from. We're taking the whole set of recommendations and moving forward to make sure that we're providing the best possible care we can for these vulnerable individuals. Yep. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, with all due respect and back to the Premier, you've had 12 years to figure this out. You're dumping millions of dollars into the salaries of people who don't see patients. Katie Hollister Loeb, in my riding, is one such case. She was originally told that 90 hours of care per month would be provided to her mother who has end-stage dementia. That was reduced first to 80 hours per month and is now being reduced all the way from 90 down to 40 hours a month. Katie and her husband had managed to cobble together some additional care through community care programs that they pay for, but that barely covers the hours that the CCAC originally promised her mother. They may have to leave their jobs. They may have to move, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, can the minister explain why Katie's mother who spent 42 years as a nurse, deserved to have her care cut so that more money can be put into administration, Question. into bank accounts of those working in administration executives at CCACs. Thank you, Good Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I think uh, most of us know that the CCACs were actually a creation of the Conservative Party in the late 1990s. 
And, Mr. Speaker, we actually saved a significant amount of money when we took the PC's 43 CCACs that they created around the province and reduced them to 14, to, uh, so that they were coordinated, coordinated well with, the, with the lens as well. We're Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, Warren. Finish. So after the uh, Progressive Conservative Party created those 43 CCACs in the 1990s, uh, this is, in fact, the, these two reports this year are really the only substantive reports that have been done by anyone of our CCACs in that 20-year period. Sir? I welcome the recommendations. We plan on implementing all of them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No questions. The member from Bramley, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier has stated that her Deputy Chief of Staff has been cleared of any charges or any wrongdoings by the OPP. However, that's not true. It's been made explicitly clear that the investigation is still ongoing, and charges may still be filed against her staff under the Provincial Elections Act. And she, well, she may very well be at the centre of the scandal as a person who directed Mr. Lougheed to make the call to the Premier. Ontarians deserve honesty, and it shouldn't take the courts to get it. Will the Premier please be upfront with Ontarians and address the allegations of bribery in her office? Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just uh, correct what the, uh, the member opposite said. What I said is that Pat Sarbera's counsel have told her that there will be no criminal charges laid against her, Mr. Speaker. I also said that, as far as I know, the investigation by Elections Ontario is ongoing. So I just want to correct what the member said. We have cooperated with the investigations. We will continue to cooperate with the investigations, Mr. Speaker. But there is now an issue before the court, and I will not comment on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Premier, in fact, is quoted as saying, quote, I never believed that my staff did anything wrong. But the reality is, her Deputy Chief of Staff is still under ongoing investigation. How is it that the Premier had no knowledge that her staff and a high-ranking Liberal campaign team member were engaging in illegal activity during the by-election? It's taken an investigation and criminal charges laid by the OPP to uncover corruption in the Premier's office. How could the Premier be so unaware of this alleged illegal activity in her own office by her own staff? Thank you, Premier. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Again, Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised by the line of questioning from the Deputy Leader, who yeah. is uh, an esteemed uh, member of the same profession that I share as a, as a lawyer. And uh, Speaker knows job. really well knows really well uh, that uh, court proceedings uh, uh, must not be interfered with. I'm sure he's advised clients in the past uh, to do the same, to make sure that they let the courts decide uh, if a matter is uh, under court proceeding. So I think, Speaker, all the questions that he's been asking, uh, he's essentially soliciting the government, the premier, uh, to, uh, to move away from that very well-known principle in our system uh, where we keep uh, the, the political uh, system separate from our legal system. I would urge the member uh, opposite that we should focus on real issues that matters to Ontarians, people, uh, issues like building our communities up, making sure that we continue to build an infrastructure and ensure that our province's economy growing every single day. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Ontario is a leading jurisdiction for the exploration and production of minerals in Canada and a major player across the world. The mining and exploration industry is an incredibly important contributor to our provincial economy. This is particularly clear in my community of Sudbury with a rich history in mining, Mr. Speaker. And while lower metal prices are having an impact, the forecast for mineral production in Sudbury is bright. The area is home to several of Ontario's key advanced mineral exploration projects. Our government continues to invest in this important sector and ensure that the mining sector remains a vibrant part of our province's economy. So, Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister inform the House on the status of the mining industry Question. in Ontario and its significance to our provincial economy? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And let me thank the member for Sudbury for the question. Certainly one of the strongest advocates for the mining sector in the Ontario legislature. Thank you so much. 
And, Speaker, we are indeed proud of the uh, fact that Ontario remains a leading jurisdiction uh, for the exploration and the production of uh, minerals in Canada and a major player across the world. We have world expertise in mine financing, geology, engineering, the advantages of a strong economy, competitive business costs, and uh, world-class research in the development environment as well. The bottom line is pretty interesting. In 2003, exploration expenditures in the province of Ontario were $219 million. In 2014, despite some of the challenges in the sector, they were over $500 million, which is great news. The value of mineral production. 2003 mineral production of the province, $5.7 billion, a lot. 2014, over $11 billion, a record setting performance. Thank you, Speaker. It is part of our government's plan to build Ontario up by creating a dynamic and supportive environment where businesses can prosper. Ontario is a leader not only in the Canadian mining industry, but also globally. There are hundreds of international companies in Ontario engaging in mineral exploration and hundreds more in supplies and services sector who benefit from that investment. The total number of direct jobs in mineral production was 26,000 in 2014. There are also an additional 50,000 jobs associated with manufacturing and processing. Mr. Speaker, and the mineral sector is the largest private sector employer of Aboriginal peoples in Canada. I know that the minister recently celebrated the success of Detour Gold at their site just outside of Cochrane. Can the minister please elaborate on the Question. status of the gold sector in Ontario? Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. That's a, again, a great follow-up. Uh, just last week, I was joined by uh, a number of uh, municipal leaders uh, and Aboriginal leaders uh, on an exciting trip to Detour's Gold, Detour Gold's um, Detour Gold site, just you know, a couple of hundred kilometers from uh, Cochrane, as they poured their one millionth ounce of gold. And, and that, of course, is only 30 months after their first uh, gold bar in February 2013. It was a tremendous experience to uh, see them pour the molten gold. Gold and only moments after I was holding that solid gold bar in my hand, wouldn't let them, they wouldn't let me take it with me. Let's put our province's uh, gold sector in perspective, Speaker. Approximately two thirds of the exploration spending have gone towards uh, exploration for gold in 2014, with similar spending expected this year, and much of this spending is yes, the uh, gold projects in traditional gold camps across northern Ontario. We've got a great story to tell the mining sector, uh, Mr. Speaker, and certainly we're very, very Thank proud you. of this one role on Ontario. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, I hope you will remember in 2013, municipalities in Ontario were hit with a major ice storm that took out hydro for days and resulted in damages that cost millions of dollars. Almost two years later, many municipalities are still waiting for part of the emergency support they were promised. When asked why this was taking so long, the Parliamentary Assistant of Municipal Affairs and Housing blamed the municipalities. Could the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing tell us whether he agrees the delay is the fault of municipalities or whether the provincial government should take the blame? Here, here. Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, someone once said uh, no one's guilty but everybody's responsible, so I, I wouldn't want to tag responsibility for the slowness of any system on anyone, uh, especially the federal government that has to clear the applications and are much more stringent in terms of the requirements, which played uh, some role. I wouldn't want to do that in this house because that would be uh, that would be unfair. So uh, you know there were some there were some struggles. Municipalities had to document uh, their real costs. There was a procedure uh, set out to allow that to happen. We followed that procedure, and uh, there was a, there was a lot of money delivered to municipalities. To assist money that we hadn't budgeted for, but still delivered. Oh, Mr. Speaker, partial funding after two years is not the emergency support these municipalities had been promised. <laughs> the government took over nine months to even create an application and waited until November to do the training. That's the following year. We all know municipalities went to great lengths to get those applications done last winter and get them in. Um, municipalities, and with that you will know municipalities are not the problem with this program. Would the minister apologize for his parliamentary assistance attempt to blame municipalities and apologize for his failure 
to deliver the emergency support municipality yeah, yeah. now and yesterday, not next. You see this, please? You see this, please? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, we'd uh, much rather point to uh, We'd much rather point direction than fingers. Uh, I'm not going to apologize on behalf of municipalities for whatever time it took for them to get their uh, material together. Uh, we respect municipalities. They work hard. And by the way, let me just take a minute to compliment the EMS workers and the hydro workers Order. who worked tirelessly to uh, recover from that ice, ice storm. It was, a, it was something that befell our province, which we didn't anticipate. But when push came to shove, we all worked together to respond appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelodeon. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question sera pour la Première My question is for the Prime Minister. The Premier. Junior is. They know he is a Liberal fundraiser for the Premier, and right now for Justin Trudeau. They know that he is a senior Liberal insider who does the bidding for the provincial and federal parties in Sudbury and beyond. The Premier was given a chance to show some integrity and show that she is the Premier for all of Ontario. Instead, Speaker, why has the Premier consistently put well-connected Liberal insiders ahead of the interests of the people of Sudbury? When will the interests of the good people of Sudbury actually come first? Else, Thank you, uh, Speaker. Again, uh, I, I would restate that uh, what member is asking about it, it, it uh, speaks uh, to a matter that is before the courts and it will be highly inappropriate uh, to interfere in the matter. Speaker, this government has uh, uh, continues to work hard and ha has invested in uh, heavily uh, in, in improving the lives of the people of Sudbury. Speaker, when it comes to investing in our health care and education in Sudbury, the, the, the levels, uh, the, the investments have been at record level uh, over the last. Last uh, 12 years, Speaker, and we're very proud of everything that we have done in Sudbury. The work that our former member of provincial parliament, Cabinet Minister Rick Barlucci, did on behalf of the people of Sudbury, and the work that the member, the current member of Sudbury, continues to do on behalf of the Sudbury. That community is much better off over the last uh, 12 years of investment in our health care and education system than ever be, and Answer. we stand by that record. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Everybody in Sudbury knows what role Jerry Lawhey Jr. played in the Sudbury by-election for the Premier and that he is playing right now for Mr. Trudeau. He is a senior Liberal insider and he does whatever is necessary for the Liberal Party. In all of the conversations between the Premier, Mrs. Sorbara, Mr. Trudeau, Mr. Thibault and Mr. Lawhey, not one did what is best for the people of Sudbury ever come up. Not one speaker. Will the Premier admit that through all of this, it has always been about what is best for the Liberal Party and never about what is best for the good people of Sudbury? My question is simple, Speaker. When will the interests of the question. good people of Sudbury come ahead of the interests of the Liberal Party? Thank you. Speaker, this, this government and this Premier will continue to stand by all communities across this province, including Sudbury. Speaker, we have invested in incredible uh, amount of, uh, amount of uh, uh, investment when it comes to health care uh, and infrastructure in Sudbury. And that is why, Speaker, after the great work that Rick Barlucci did in that community, that community, once again in a by-election, voted for the current member from Sudbury, Glenn Thibault. Why? Because they supported a government that has been continued to invest in Sudbury, who's put always the needs and wants of the Sudbury community uh, up front. And that that is why we have somebody who has been who has devoted his life and it's uh, serving Sudbury and now is a member of the government and continues to serve that community. We Answer. will not we will not leave Sudbury behind, Speaker, and we'll continue to make sure that Sid Sudbury is ahead and as a priority for this government. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa South. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Over the summer, our government hosted the Climate Summit of the Americas from July 7th to July 9th. Speaker, like many Ontarians, constituents in my riding of Ottawa South are concerned by climate change and greenhouse gas pollution. They're worried about what kind of world their children and their grandchildren will be left with if we don't take strong action on climate change. 
There is frustration at the, long of, uh, at the lack of strong action on climate change from national governments and, in particular, from their federal government. Speaker, through you, could the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change inform the House about the outcomes of the Climate Summit of the Americas and their importance as part of Ontario's leadership in fighting climate change? Thank you, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. I, I want to thank the member for Ottawa South for this and for his leadership on this issue, Mr. Speaker. It was uh, the, the results of the summit were quite extraordinary. We have 20, 22 uh, members of the Brazilian, U.S., Mexican, and Canadian Federation sign on to an agreement that have now committed to enough emissions reductions between now and 2030, equivalent to the annual emissions in one year of the United States, Mr. Speaker. And a matter of fact, Governor and Brown and I, two days ago, were standing on a stage in New York City, inducting 14 more members uh, from the Americas into. Uh, into this group, doubling the number of, of countries. The United Nations uh, framework on, on climate change was so taken with this that they have now set aside a day as a result Answer. of these efforts for the first time to bring what are called subnational, international governments into the formal UN uh, uh, reduction strategy. Thank Mr. You. Speaker. This was an enormous accomplishment. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question again is back to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. And I'd like to thank him uh, for updating us on the success we had in bringing, bringing leaders from across the Americas uh, to take, together to take action on this important issue. Increasingly, provinces and states are providing leadership on climate change, especially where national governments have failed to take meaningful action. In Ontario, we beat our 2014 greenhouse gas target of 6% below 1990 levels. Ontario is continuing to demonstrate leadership on climate change. It announced in April that we will moving, be moving forward with a cap and trade system to reduce greenhouse gas pollution while keeping Ontario's industries competitive. Speaker, through you, could the Minister of Environment and Climate Change inform the House on what the commitments of the Climate Action Statement mean and why subnational action on climate change is so important? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, one of the other things that came out uh, when I was at the UN last week uh, uh, during Climate Week, uh, what came up often over and over again was the incredible leadership of Premier Wynne, Premier Cuillard, and Jerry Brown. And uh, when I was speaking with Christiana Figueres, one of the things that came out of that, Mr. Speaker, was on the first day of the summit. The Under Secretary Lacey from Mexico committed the Mexican government to work with California, Quebec, and Ontario to, to create a carbon market across America, and that is viewed as one of the most important steps to securing it. But I also want to thank members opposite, the member for Huron Bruce and the uh, member for Toronto Danforth, who uh, attended and participated and have been working, I think, to elevate this above partisan politics because it really goes to the question from the member of, from Oxford. We're going to face more more flood events like Answer. in Burlington, more damage like we saw on Go Transit. We will see many more years where we lose 80 percent of our apple crop and where things like Thank ice you. storms cost the public. And that's why we. Thank you. The member from Eglinton Lawrence on a point of order. I wonder if we could have a minute's silence for the grandfather and the three children that were killed in that horrible accident yesterday at Kirby Road in Kipling, York Region. Uh, and uh, just reflect on this incredible tragedy. The member from Eglinton Lawrence is seeking unanimous consent for a moment of silence upon the tragedy. Do we agree? Agreed. 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 Could I ask all members uh, in the House and all visitors to please rise for a moment of silence? Minister of Agriculture on a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. In the uh, public west gallery at this morning, uh, we have uh, members of the Ontario Agricultural Sustainable uh, Coalition. Uh, uh, they'll be having meetings at Queen's Park here today and hosting a reception at Room 228 later this afternoon. Thank you. The member from Burlington on a point of order. 
I'd like to uh, introduce two members, uh, two uh, members of the public from my riding of Burlington, who are in the gallery today. Members of the Canadian Association of Physician Assistants here for a lunch and reception: Denise O'Leary, President of the Ontario Chapter of the Canadian Association of Physician Assistants, and Julie Kaspersky, Speaker, Vice President of the Ontario Chapter of Canadian Association of Physician Assistants. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, on a point of order, my apologies. I, I just wanted to recognize uh, the very bright young girls from Branson Hall who were here up until a few minutes ago. Uh, these are soon to be extraordinary young women leaders, and it was very great to have them here in the House today. Um, be before we uh, move into our deferred votes, I'm going to recommend to the House and to all members, if uh, your visitors don't show up during introductions, that if you know they're coming, uh, you might want to do a pre-introduction during the time allotted for introductions that allows us to continue with the schedule that we've got established. Uh, you would be helping us uh, in, in our uh, agreed-upon process by the House leaders. If there is a change to be made, it must be made by them. Uh, we have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 9, an act to amend the Environmental Protection Act to require the, the sensation of coal use to generate electricity at generation facilities. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
members please take their seats. On December 2nd, 2014, Mr. Mo Mr. Murray moved a second reading of Bill 9, an act to amend the Environmental Protection Act to require the cessation of coal use in, uh, to generate electricity at generation facilities. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugas. Mr. Dugas. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bordinetti. Mr. Bordinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Padre. Mr. Padre. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Manga. Mr. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mr. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Dahmerla. Ms. Dahmerla. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mrs. Verniel. Mrs. Verniel. Mr. Chibol. Mr. Chibol. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Huda. Mr. Rudak. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Genova. Ms. Genova. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Satin. Ms. Satin. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jolinat. Madame Jolinat. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrest. Ms. Forrest. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes being 95 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, busy enough to before you move on. Pursuant to the order of the House dated June 2, 2015, the bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.